Tuia ki runga, tuia ki raro, tuia ngā mea katoa. Rauranga tira mā. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Shamari Kesiri tōku ingoa no ngā puhi me te whanoa apanui, ko au te pautaki o te tai kei mana tu taonga. Uh, kia ora, my name is Shamari. Aroha mai, ka kōrero au i te reo Pākehā whaa. I am the project manager for Te Tai at the Ministry for Culture and Heritage. Te Tai is a program aimed at increasing the understanding of the past by exploring treaty settlements and their enduring impact. To date, Te Tai has collected, preserved and produced a range of new information and content on treaty settlements, including over 70 audio-visual oral history interviews, an online documentary, a multimedia web story, and a range of cross-curricular educational resources for both Māori and English medium. In September 2020, during Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori, in partnership with Te Tauta Whiri i Te Reo Māori, the Māori Language Commission, we launched Te Mana o Te Reo Māori. Te Mana o Te Reo Māori is an interactive web story that explores the historical journey of Te Reo Māori from the 1200s to the present day. Today, Te Reo Māori is recognised as an important aspect of the New Zealand culture and identity, but things were not always so hopeful for our language. The journey for recognition faced significant challenges and was only achieved through the determination, the strength and the unity of Māori. Without supporters and learners, the kaupapa would not have been a success. Part of the journey was taking the Wai 11 Te Reo Māori claim to the Waitangi Tribunal, which contributed to Te Reo Māori being made an official language in 1987. Te Mana o Te Reo web story speaks to this journey. This eight-page multimedia story includes detailed biographies on 24 individuals and organisations involved in Y11 and the largest timeline ever produced detailing the decline and eventual revitalisation of Te Reo Māori. Today, we have the honour of sharing space with and hearing from Te Reo Māori champions, Justice Joe Williams, Piripi Walker, and followed by a discussion facilitated by Dr Vincent Olsen Reader. I would now like to introduce our first speaker for Te Mana o Te Reo, Piripi Walker no Ngāti Raukawa. Piripi was the Secretary of Ngā Kaifakapumo i Te Reo during its claim to the Waitangi Tribunal and is currently the Tumuaki o Raro Deputy Chair of the Society. He helped create Wellington's Te Upoko o Te Ika, the first Māori radio station in 1987 and is an author, a licensed translator and interpreter. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Piripi Walker. ま、え、パハウトク。あいつもパハウトのじゃ。え、もうずっと<笑><笑><笑> Te paia vini, koe ia te facilitator. Uh, <laughs> ne, ko au tini, e tū ana ki te mihi ka koutou katoa. Pornek, ngā hoa Māori, ngā iwi. E kura mihi ka ngā titoa ki tō kura. Ka mihi ka te ati awa, te iwi nāna, ngā whakawākato i manā ki tō rātou manai. Ta tū manako kei kwa nei, te whāna au pēki mā. Uh, o kō kiri manai, rātou i ka halawa i roti i rātou ai mā. I roti i ngā mahi. E ola tonu ana ko hoa, i nei rā ko mata mata te nuinga. Ko te nei tau tonu te tau o te wehinga tō te kua hui rei. Kāri fa kāinga te tangi hanga. E nā te mahi a te katinga nui nei. Ah, uh, wenoka hari aji marungi tana waka mata hua rahi. State Highway One, ka tu te kuza mahi nei te taho te rori ki te karanga tu kia hui rei. 
Me taku mōhio, e kau mātua mōhio a huilangi, kua tautaku i tēnei mea te katinga nui. Te tīma o te rima milion. Alira, kua tautaku. Engari huilangi, e moe, e moe, e moe, i roti te ao keitua, i roti te ahuru. Hoi anoa, e kura e tangi i tēnei rā. Ahakoa he painoho te tangi i tēnei o ngā whare kakia, he whare Māori. Kei koni ngā reo o ngā pake, kei koni ngā rātou tuhinga, kei te turnbo, kei koni ngā ripe ne kōro i te tahi a Lindema, kei koni ngā rātou reo, me ake koutu ka anō. Me taku whakapāhanu, ko te nui ngāku kōro ke rotu te reo Pākehā. I've prepared most of my talk in English. But there's plenty of Māori in it, and you will hear some voices later on. I've done my crying, writing this talk for you. But I can't guarantee you ain't a little tangi. Today on Māori Society, you're all here, I hope. You're the giants that did all the work for this in the 1970s. The largest Māori campaign ever dreamed of in Kiziki. Before Ngā Kei Whakapumo had the cheek to emerge on the scene. The largest petition ever taken in New Zealand, I believe, was the petition that our Māori took to the Whare Pāre Mata, calling for the teaching of Māori in schools. And I think the one on broadcasting was as big. And they went all around the houses, Hunter Jackson, Ngā Tamatoa, and I mentioned the cases of Tiringa Mangu Mihaka in my talk. Hoi anō he mihi nui, he poto te wā, ki ora tata. I'd like to start with the decision and preparations for the language claim to the Waitangi Tribunal. My name's Pitipi Walker, I'm a descendant of Raukaua, from Huia, who had Keko Piri, who had my ancestor Hapeki Tuarangi. I've been involved with my iwi since my time as a young adult, since the time I got to know Joe. Um... On an April night in 1983, the Wellington Māori Language Board held its monthly meeting at an old Victoria University house on Kelvin Parade. This is a very local story, this. But Vine Deloria, the great Native American leader and chief, said, Indigenous affairs, the real action is at the local level. That's you and us. So this is a Molesworth Street story, this yarn. The two-story house on Kelvin Parade, now demolished to make way for the Von Zedlitz building, was the first university marae, the Heringawaka. It was previously the home to the Anglican chaplaincy on the campus. There were around 10 of us there that night. As it was the AGM, the election of officers for the Incorporated Society was held. I'd been to the inaugural meeting to the board a year earlier. Andrew Robb, who I'm delighted to say is here with us today, today on Māori Storwit, ex Victoria student and Māori language activist indicated he wished to resign. Andrew and his partner Alison Green were setting up the Wellington Māori Language Resource Centre and needed to focus their effort in one direction. I was elected secretary while the late Huirangi Waikirapuru of Ngāti Ruanui became chairman. And Huirangi left us in April this year, aged 90 years. We became co-workers on the cause and Andrew and Huirangi became close friends. The meeting agreed to do two things. First, Ngā Kaifa Kapumo decided to establish a Māori language radio station for a trial period in Wellington for two months in July. Two months off in July. An FM radio station was a suggestion I'd been turning over in my mind. That's another story. That night, the group tabled a proposal that they take a claim to the Waitangi Tribunal over the Māori language. I had been fired up by my experience making documentaries for Radio New Zealand in Taranaki on the Tiatiawa claims at Waitara. We had also read moving papers on the denial of language rights by Dr Richard Benton. We had to hand Bill Hastings' monograph, The Right to an Education in Māori. That's our Bill Hastings of Pornik, which spelt out the legal basis for such a claim. The claim would be against successive governments in New Zealand alleging they had breached the Treaty of Waitangi by not protecting and promoting te reo. The language was now in danger of dying out. This new claim would be based to some extent on the claims by Te Atiawa over their seafood reefs in the Waitara area. The claims had not related just to physical fisheries, but on the rights to preserve customs, gathering food, caring for resources, spiritual beliefs, identity and tribal prestige, part of, quote, keeping the table laden for visitors, close quote. There was some scepticism about our ability as a small incorporated society to take such a legal case over te reo Māori. 
It led to intense debate among us in the two years following, preparing for hearing. After discussion, the Hui decided to initiate such a claim on the responsibilities of the Crown and the right of speakers to use the Māori language, which we've seen beautifully demonstrated just now. Professor Sid Mead, as co marcher of the group that night, assessed the basis for the claim like a potter checking a clay pot for shape and serviceability. After the resolutions on radio and the language claim were passed, he said, look at that, too good kaupapa for us to work on, just like that. Hui Rangi, our champion, our chairperson and inspiring leader. Hui Rangi had been a joiner, a tradesman. He became a woodwork teacher. He was working then as a senior Māori language teacher at Wellington Polytech, developing what was probably New Zealand's most effective Māori course for adults in those years. He was a keen student of political change. He had led campaigns on language rights since he was in high school in the 1940s, where he was denied the right to study his native language. A fantastic orator, a true native speaker of the Taranaki dialect, raised in the Parihaka tradition, and I acknowledge the Parihaka day tomorrow and the talk we're going to have here at the library with Ruekere. Huirangi was also a very funny jokester. These qualities were present in his dealings with all, no matter how powerful or intimidating, and in the most serious situations. Marka Jones once told me how hard it would be to find anyone like Huirangi, the Renaissance man. Anyone replacing him would struggle to match him, so fluent in the language, and he's got the humour. Of all the years working with Huirangi, I found the experience enjoyable and uplifting. We always spoke informal, light-hearted Māori and Māori only. Huirangi taught me how the language should be enjoyed, savoured, spoken, laughed and lived. The Ohumahi, the workers in the team. Ngāji Pōneh. That's a good name, Ngāji Pōneh. That's everybody. Tato Tato. Or as Te Fiti said, the name of his house, Iwi Katoa. Following up these decisions, Hirini Moko Mead began the huge task of framing a winning argument on the extent of guarantees of rangatiratanga under Article 2. Did they include the right to possession of the language? I'll leave the rest of that to Joe. They did they, Amster Reedy and June Mead fanned out across the teaching and school sector to assemble a body of evidence from Māori educationists. They've both left us now too. Dr. Richard Benton, still going strong in Hamilton, on the banks of the Waikato River. The renowned linguist, then based at the New Zealand Council of Educational Research, and his wife, Nina Benton, were both passionate people with a social justice background. Richard was a gentle but incisive speaker and a fearsomely good writer, having produced commanding papers on most of the areas which will be traversed by the claim. Those papers formed the linguistic evidence base of the hearings in due course. They'd been expecting and anticipating the claim all along and were prepared for it. Joe Williams was a new, young, newly minted lawyer at the time. Joe met with me and the two of us framed an initial statement of claim at that wonderful headquarters of Ngākei for Kapumo, known as the Colonial Coffee Lounge <laughs> on the terrace, still operating. <laughs> They've moved on from Scotch eggs. Another 50 odd meetings followed. I was going to say, I recall part of that claim being written on a brown paper packet. They put the... <laughs> anyway. All good things start life as scribble. That's true. The other meetings were often at Huirangi's flat on the terrace with Huirangi and Professor Mead to produce the claim which was written entirely in Te Reo, with Auntie Maka Jones always present. We submitted it in early 1984. Then senior minds at the tribunal felt our effort was too long once submitted and assisted us to write a shorter version over the next year of preparation for hearings. They wanted a working version that was concise. The document they produced was in English and we worked on it with them to draft the final shorter version. They felt it communicated the essence of the claim better to all of those government departments who were going to be summoned to appear. Richard mentioned to me later he wanted to give me an IBM golf ball typewriter of his he no longer needed. A secretary, he thought I would need it. Could I go round and pick it up? The IBM Golf War was fairly modern at the time and became the producer of the secretarial work for the board. And preparing for the talk, I found quite a lot of our material, material produced on the golf ball. <laughs> That's the actual claim. <laughs> <laughs> 
that I've just referred to, Hui Rangi wrote, refined by Hedini and others, and then typed up by yours truly. And that's our moko at the front. It's a manaya, which Hedini designed. The manaya is on top of a moko moko, a lizard. It's got its mouth on that. The, mana the manaya at the top is the tiwi Māori. The lizard underneath is tiwi Pākehā. The Māori's got a hold of the Pākehā, but the Pākehā's managed to get round and grab a hold of the tail of the Māori. <laughs> That's the true meaning of that from Hedini. <laughs> Finances and fundraising. Marka Jones, auntie, was our treasurer. She was the daughter of Paolo Telemere, the leader of the Ringatū Church until his death. Marka, originally from Omai on the Bay of Plenty, was a multi-talented person, a minister herself, a teacher, a song composer, teacher of kapahaka, true artistic expert. She was also the sister of Sir Monita, who I'm pleased to say you're going to hear from shortly. She, he succeeded his father, leader of the Ringatū Church. Now, Kaifu Kapumo needed to complete an annual audit of its accounts and was helped in this every year by Ellen Perry, a retired accountant living in Shannon. Our paths had crossed earlier at Wellington Polytechnic in 1975 when Ellen had struggled to teach me basic accounting. I had been sponsored to do one year of the Certificate in Accounting by my employer, the New Zealand Manufacturers Federation, as a young married man. It took around four weeks of nodding off to sleep in Ellen's class to realise accounting wasn't my vocation. <laughs> it's a corny joke, but it's true. Our early budget was around $10,000 per hearing in 1985 dollars. We had thought there might need to be three such hearings, a total of 30000 We would need to go into debt to get things paid for. I remember producing the first few budgets, and I've also found over the weekend the final budget in Whatarangi's handwriting, <laughs> where everything of mine has been taken hold of, and he's doubled it. <laughs> The board had a little nest egg of $5,000 in kiss bonds at the BNZ Cathedral Mart branch in Molesworth Street. Does anyone remember when Molesworth Street used to have actual banks? We had a Westpac bank. We had a national bank. And of course, the great sainted cathedral branch of the BNZ where our account was. In April 85, just before the hearings, Mark and I went to see the manager, Russell. His name has slipped. But he said, Oh, Maori, get a pain of the hair in Russell. At the branch, he begged for a further overdraft to fund the first hearing. We begged for one, scheduled for June. He was a serious middle-aged man with an engaging gentle manner. The amount we sought was 5000 Maka and I showed him our fundraising letters to various organisations. To my utter amazement, he said the whole thing looked like important work and our bona fides convinced him. Our lawyers agreed to be volunteers like the rest of us. The largest financial supporters of the claim were the individual churches, Corso organisations like the Anglican Pastorates, the EJD, the Runanga Whakawhanaunga. An anonymous Wellington person made contact through an intermediary and donated $5,000 to the cause. God bless you if you are in this room today. The legal team. Huirangi and I made contact with Rawirangi Tawira, one of the founders of the society. <coughs> the Te Reo Māori Society, still highly active in branches around the country at that time in the 80s. Koro Jews, of course, who you're going to hear from, was his father-in-law. He came down and kicked us off. Joe Williams, with us today, and now a judge of the Supreme Court of New Zealand, was then pulled in, along with Annette Sykes, to become the legal team framing up the arguments and the case. There was self-doubt. The question was whether it was a good idea to proceed. Others with serious minds doubted the claim on the language should even be going to the tribunal. Māori minds. At one early meeting, one of our leaders quite rightly challenged those of us flying ahead with preparations. We acted as if it could only be a good thing to have the language and rights before the tribunal. This leader asked us, what if the claim fails? He was anxious the tribunal might declare that speakers had only limited rights conferred on them by the Treaty of Waitangi, that the Crown had only enshrined very limited rights to use the reo in the past, and the limited status might be seen as the status quo. Huirangi stood to answer saying, No matter how the claim is tested, we are clear in our minds about the grounds for the claim and we believe totally in it. He believed that this clarity satisfied the Māori test for making it a good kaupapa, the rights long needed to be 
long denied needed to be traversed before the tribunal and let the future take matters care of matters after that. At another early meeting, others expressed anxiety, advising some would no doubt see a claim about the Māori language not specifically mentioned in the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840 as a misuse of the tribunal. Again, Māori advisers having doubts. Have I got to do but? Hey, bye. The tribunal was regarded by most as a vehicle to deal only with Māori claims to land, forest and fisheries. There's a little bit more here about how later on we made a card and we were lucky to have that bank manager. My repayment of him was to go to his bank, insisting on the right to use Māori in translations with my little card. <laughs> the cards were based on a Welsh idea we'd heard about. On the cards was printed the words, I am a Māori speaker and wish to talk to a Māori speaker, as is my constitutional right under the Treaty of Waitangi. <laughs> there is no reflection on you in this request. Time's short, so I can't tell you the whole shaggy dog story. Um, how we got into trouble with it at the Reserve Bank when a very large Māori gentleman came out to the front and asked me if I had an account, for a start. <laughs> so we'll cut all that short. I found over the weekend I've got 350 of these left. So today, we have to have a little gimmick. As you leave, if you don't mind the manky old card, you're free to be given a card. Membership of Ngākei Whakapūmo is achieved by simply attending a meeting. So we will go today, Andrew, from 20 members to 210. <laughs> They'll be given out at the door. <coughs> the role of Tiatiawa, Te Heringa Waka, and Kokiri, Malai, I mentioned in my Mihi in Te Reo, did a fantastic job taking on the whole responsibility of such a difficult claim. It was an unusual claim. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit as we just go into these slides here. Um, the claim alleged Māori had been harmed by neglect of the language. Language rights at the time, Joe, I think, will pick this up but the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was around, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was around, people had tried to enforce it. I've mentioned that Tiringa Mangumihaka's claim was mentioned in the claim document. People had attempted to enforce rights to you speak Māori in the courts and the civil service. Uh, the tribunal claim signalled the end of Māori reliance on goodwill measures. Whatarangi Winiata said it's time to go on the front foot. A different tactic among a society of traditionalists who had not thwarted directly the wishes of the Crown much in the 20th century. The consequences are too heavy. So this is a change in tactics. There was to be no more waiting for Crown inquiry, acceptance of petitions, royal commissions, will try the tribunal, a new body with what Jia Jia was showed had moral teeth. If your copper was right, and Huidang had been trained deeply in that tradition, just to drive it forward, drive it forward. The strategy was one of finding where the change could be brought about through enforcement of the treaty. Hirini Moko said at one of those planning meetings, the Treaty of Waitangi has teeth. And that's a good guiding principle. The legal mechanism for action, the Treaty of Waitangi Act, and I'll leave that to Joe. Which clause of the treaty, the preamble, the protection by Victoria, of Māori from settlers, Article 1, the ceding of Kawanatanga, Article 2, the protection of lands, forests and fisheries in Taonga, or Article 3. Some of the Kaumatua who came, like Māori Marsden, located their evidence at Article 3, rights and privileges of British subjects. That's where their thinking took them to on the claim. But uh, 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 Joe will remember from being in the legal team exactly where we located the main thrust. I was just the driver, <laughs> driving to hire pool to pick up the lectern, Driving Auntie Media around, National Library. Auntie Media was our interpreter. And picking up people from our shareport, airport arrivals. The Hawaiians came from Hawaii. The resources we've talked about, the funding. What did the claim allege? I'll just touch on the acts. The Māori Affairs Act 1953 were in breach of the treaty. The official recognition in, was to be sought in the courts, government departments and local bodies. The Education Act had no provision for the education in Māori. Māori language had been harmed by the Broadcasting Corporation. No Māori in radio and television. And the Health and Hospitals Act. Interesting that in the years of the fairly soft tribunal recommendations, it was the hospitals that moved fastest in signalisation. And the museums, Arabat. So James Henry, he spoke. 
We gave the first three days to the kaumātua at the marae of being inducted as a very young man into te runanga o ngā rangatira o te tiri and he provided probably the definitive evidence on the policy of suppression and spoke of being whipped in school for speaking Māori. I mention here Mr Richard Seddon, Premier of New Zealand, said during the debate on the Māori Rights Bill in 1896, Hansard, page 311, that Parliament which represented the people should pass laws that should bear evenly and fairly upon both races, unquote. They were, they were fine words, but unfortunately were not put into practice. I suppose many laws today are still one-sided. The language is the core of our Māori culture and mana, ko te reo, te Māori, o te mana Māori. The language is the life force, if you like, of the mana Māori. If the language dies, as some predicts, what have we left to us? Then I ask us, our own people, who are we? Language, according to O.W. Holmes, is a solemn thing. It grows out of life, out of its agonies and ecstasies, its wants and its weariness. There was another job, of course, was enlisting the help of Kui and Koroa from around the country, and Huirangi did a lot of that. Um, in listening to a recording, I'm going to play a bit of you about Huirangi. Um, he went to Waitangi and gave a letter to Sir James in February of that year to come and attend, and Sir James came. Te Kapunga Koro Jews, founder of Te Reo Māori Society at Victoria University, a senior lecturer, a traditionally trained tohunga, he wanted to look past the treaty, acknowledge Koro, Te Reo Māori Society, the founder. Nā te Pākehā why get caught up arguing about the treaty, law, etc.? Joe can answer that. <laughs> There's a good answer to it. He outlined the traditional Māori education system, pre-European. He discussed language, its relation to identity, and presented a classical, philosophically perfect statement in the oral tradition. Towards the end of it, on this clip, you'll hear him pick up Sir Graham Latimer, tribunal member. God bless you, Sir Graham. Dear friend. He caught him glancing at his watch. So this is one for you Māori speakers in the room. Have a listen to what he says. Because <laughs> Koro refused to translate. Koro refused to translate. He wouldn't let Auntie Media translate. Uh, <laughs> What I'm going to get your mind, I have a tongue after one. After one, or tell more. Or tell Tamu, or tell Kohat. Going after a one, I'm going to get a book and a win. Going after a two with a win. Going after a Kohanga win. Going after a two with a land. Or more to eat a tree to water. これらとだとだとだ。え、たにたにいらたうが、わたんが、え、ファカヘケコレロいらたう。これのらねコロマテロイマトマトフペ、カツト。へぴうのらねとととこてり、とまはんのこてりん。こてちな。へコロロかとか
Kwe ni ngā hosa, no mūna te tri te waita. Ka ki te ea te kere ama te tiro nantun tāne. A ka te te porotene te kaki o te Māorita. Ka te haere i rua te tāpae. He said, Takarema, I see you glancing at your timer, your watch. This is cutting off the head of our Māori customs. <laughs> and then he acknowledges with a friendly wave, good on you, Takarema. They knew what was what, and everybody had their part to play that day. God bless the tribunal, support him, te haikure jui, and uh, Takarema, for the wonderful job they did of listening to the claim. Um, this is a picture of a group of kaumātua. On the left are two kuia that came from Auckland, Middle Stevens, of Tararawa and Huia Martin, sitting next to her, to support us. Um, her whānau kāni supplied this to me. They had the first three days. The hearings began in a winter southerly storm. She looked around at the tohu. I like the otherness and difference of the Māori cultural world. That's what they brought to the hearing. It's not a Pākehā world. They're looking at the tohu, the signs. There's a storm. Mātua pā mai te kino, kā tahino te pai kā tāmai. That's a verbatim quote, which I haven't got on tape on this bit. The meaning, first there must be this adversity, then good things will come. Kia ora anō koe tū katoa, katoa katoa huru nō te whare ni. Ā, kia ora anō koe te whare, whakahiro hiro e tū ni. Me te... パパ he tina na Māori teni kui e tuatuni. He wairua Māori. He Māori Māori. He mita Māori. He whakaaro Māori. Engari. Koti. Te ho mai. E te pākeha. Morning to Delamere. The brother of Auntie Maka came down to support. He addressed the panel by first names, a particular statement to Paul Tim, the non Maori on the panel. He said, I would like to get close to you, Paul. I've been around, uh, I'd like to get close to the table, very much so, about the Te Whakapu Mau Te Reo. <clears throat> I've been sit, sitting here listening I suppose to go back in the morning but I don't think I'll go back until until we settle things to my liking <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Morning he goes on to ask the Paul to come and stay with him at his house so they can wake up at 3 o'clock every morning for karakia <laughs> and sing Zahimene. That's the next bit. I'm sorry, yeah, Homa, I'm going, going over time here. Um, one more. I'll just mention Bruce Beggs. I won't play the clip. It's on. We've got two sets of recordings. I acknowledge the engineers who made these recordings. I'd like to say thanks to the engineers way back in time. Radio New Zealand team who did the better quality ones you're hearing and the Justice Department crew, the Waitangi Tribunal crew who manned those table mics. Let's acknowledge and salute our sound engineers. It's a treasure to have them. <laughs> Professor Bruce Biggs said, I said I predicted in 1968 a slow but inevitable further retreat of the language, but I was wrong about this. So I said I predicted in 1968 a slow but inevitable retreat further retreat of the language. I was wrong about this. In 1975, I revised my opinion. It said, it is now clear that the language is in a state of rapid decline. Yeah. So he doubled up 
on the terror, which all of us young ones, we used to beg him not to say that stuff. <laughs> Why have you written that? I was his driver. I was his driver, and he was, he was good to get to know. But um, what did the tribunal recommend? Well, these are well-known recommendations. We got the tota fiti in the end, that an inquiry be held into the way Māori children and ways in which are educated, that's missing, and ways in which all Māori children can learn the language. I'm going straight to the end of these slides because we're over time. Um, the education system was condemned. It is a dismal failure and no amount of delicate phrasing can mask that fact. Uh, findings like that were always on the cards from this tribunal. The aim was to conquer a new position and prepare soil. The Māori language is a taonga. The treaty finding created protection. The rights guaranteed in New Zealand law were able to be asserted and defended in the courts. They formed the basis of decisions on language and radio and language and television. I said here that political parties are still quietly in opposition to the recommendation of the tribunal that Māori be automatically able to be used as of right in government departments and in public bodies and local government and so on. We still do not have that. We have more or less the same level of recognition that we had in the 1953 Māori Affairs Act. Despite the Act of 87, despite the Act of 2016, the revision of the Māori Language Act, the claim did not succeed on language rights. The 2016 revision of the Māori Language Act did not implement any of the main recommendations of the Waitangi Tribunal on rights to language, or Y262, which Joe was going to talk to you about, the revisiting of the hearing. The right of Māori to use, speak and write Māori in public life. It's still more or less the same as the 1953 Act. Kia ora tato. Ina koe matua piripi, kei te mihi ki a koe, ina kōrero hi tōria, kua rangatira tō tātou kaupapa i a koe. Our second speaker, Justice Joe Williams, no Ngāti Pukenga, Waitaha me Tapuika, contributed to the organising of the Y11 claim while a junior law lecturer at Victoria University. He has served on the Māori Land Court and as cha was chairperson of the Waitangi Tribunal, and in 2019, he was the first Māori person appointed to the Supreme Court. I would now like to invite you all to join me in extending a warm welcome to our second speaker, Justice Williams. Ngākui. Kā te kwa whai ake nei a i Māwi mua nana ko Māwi tiki tiki tēnei e tū ake ana kwa pau katoa ngā kōrero. Whaino au kei te riri atu ki taku kau mātua nei. Uh, mo te ahua i, I tāna whakapau i ngā kōrero. Hoano tāku he, he, he tahi tahi atu i ngā konga konga kwa mahu e ihoa i āia i tāna tēpū. Nō reira uh, ki a hatia, rātau ki a rātau. Ana, e whatamai ana i te wā i, uh, I tā piripi kōrero. Uh, ia tā himi, ia Māori, ia monita, ia māka, Ya huirangi, era atua o te rawa i noho ai māu ko tēnei i ngā reke reke o rātau mā. Uh, mei kore tūpono he paku akoranga ka taka mai ki runga kia māua. Haeno, ko ngā hua, kua puta. A kua, kua hanga kō lehe lehe ngā hua nei, a Ko hanga maro ke haere ngā hua e nei hua toko rua nei. Uh, kei ko nei, nō reira kei te mihi ake, uh, ki a koutou katoa te hui nga nui, uh, e hui nei. Engari, ko te, hui, ko te mihi nui, ko te mihi ki te kaupapa. Uh, uh, me te mihi ki tēnei, te aho tana kōrero. Uh, I āia te ngako te kōrero no te mea, i āia te ngako te mahi. Ka ua tātou e pō e he hei riro mā tētehi, kao. Ko te kauenga nui i āna paki hiwi. Ana, ko te ahua o tēnei tangata, e harai te tangata tutuki wāwai. He upoko pakaru ke tēnei tangata. Nā reira ka pakaru ngia tana upoko. I runga i tō tātou reo te kaupapa. 
No reira uka mea tu ki aia mana te kororo tu atahi, mākou e tahi tahi muri mai. No reira a huri noa i tō tā tauwhare. Te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou. Um, thanks to Te Tai for making this possible. Uh, I thought I would acknowledge your contribution by wearing mine. <laughs> That's what my children call a dad joke. Um, PDP has laid out how the claim happened. I, I, my presence here is under false pretenses, really. Uh, the hard work was done by PDP and Huirangi and Fatarangi and, um, uh, and of course, Rawiri, Rangi Tawira. Uh, and I was, I was just a young smartass. Um, so I, I thought I'd tell you some young smartass stories that I recall at the time and then reflect on uh, what's happened since. Um, the amazing thing about, I, I remember, I couldn't get to all of the hearings. I was, I was working as a junior lecturer, so I had to go teach people, uh, although my mind was elsewhere. But uh, the hearings at Waifu 2 were just extraordinary for a young fella to, to watch going on. Um, and the hui's afterwards at Kōkiri Marae, where the ko, these komatu didn't stay in hotels. They stayed at Kōkiri Marae, and so we would all go there and manaki them, and they'd, they'd talk about all sorts of things. These old 2-8 battalion men, these kuia, they just talk about what they'd seen, what they'd done, and their belief in their kaupapa. And it was, I mean, I'm, it, it was such a privilege to be there because it never was never repeated. Um, I remember the uh, uh, Māori Marsden, Sunny Waru, Tanifaro Waru, um, Sir James here, Nare. After the hui um, at Kokiri Marae, talking about battles that the battalion had been in and the terrible things Petawatere had done to the Germans. <laughs> and, and these stories came alive because these were the people who were there. Um, and I never forgot those stories, they were like, tattooed on my heart. So was the. Um, Sir James Henare stood up and, you know, because I was a young smartass, I had no idea who Sir James Henare was. So this man, sort of caramel skin, um, stood up and said, uh, I remember it, uh, members of the tribunal, <laughs> I crave your indulgence for just a moment. <laughs> you can tell if you heard his voice, it was the most polished voice. He was uh, uh, commander, he was CEO of the battalion. So he knew how to fake Pākehā accents, as it turns out. <laughs> and I remember sitting there thinking I was just a kid and, and, you know, one of the 1980s radicals, and we weren't interested in that bullshit. <laughs> and, and, um, and I remember thinking, I said, what? <laughs> Peter P., who the hell is that? <laughs> and, of course, then um, Sir James switched to Māori. And I've got to tell you, his Māori was better than his English. Like, it was exquisite Māori. Perfectly modulated, not a, not a piece of grammar out of place. And, and, and I was just blown away. Like I'd never heard someone speak Māori like that before. I'd read it in the Bible, but I'd never seen it. And there he was. It was just dripping off his tongue like honey. And luckily... I didn't say anything about how disgusted I was <laughs> as this apparently pompous fart stood up and <laughs> craved the indulgence of that tribunal. I spoke, um, and so it was all the way through the week as the Māori world came. You heard Monita, no more spiritual man on the planet than Monita Delamere. Uh, I had quite a lot to do with him in his time on the Waitangi Tribunal, and my brother married him to the Delamere, so... Uh, I knew him and knew his whānau very well. And everything was wairua for that man, everything. He saw wairua everywhere, and that sort of thing, if he said, I want to get close to the table, he meant it in a wairua way, 
I mean, he meant it in a Maori way. And unless you kind of hang out with those old people, you, you sometimes can't see the difference. You can't, those of, there are people here I know um, who've also had the privilege of working with Monita uh, in the Waitangi Tribunal. Um, and he had just had, you know, he had this aura about him that made you go, ugh. Anyway. And so it, I, I just want to get across the idea that it was like that all week as the entire Māori world turned up in support of this claim by this bunch of Wellington folks um, who were known about the country, but you know, this wasn't the New Zealand Māori Council. This was Ngā Kaifakapū Māui Te Reo. You know, Ngā Kaifakapū Māui Te Hu. And, and so, and it's a tribute to this guy and Huirangi that the Māori world came and showed its support without a word of dissent. The effect of which was to give courage to that tribunal. I mean, it was also already an excellent tribunal. Two Māoris, a Ngāp, a Ngāpuhi, one of the finest legal minds we had. Uh, I'm not talking about Graham, I'm talking about Eddie. <laughs> a Ngāpuhi and an Irish Catholic. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better <laughs> panel, really. And in many ways, I think Paul Tim was more radical than the others <laughs> because he had this history of exactly the same story with respect to his own language. I'll tell you one story, and then that's probably already over time, right? Uh, uh, I stood up to speak, and you've got to remember I was, you know, I had a beard, but it wasn't grey, and um, I had a plait running down to the middle of my back. I, I was cool. Uh, <laughs> Maranga, that sort of. <laughs> so I, you know, of course I was petrified inside, but I needed to show that I didn't care how cool, how how flash this legal. Anyway, so so what happens when someone who's deeply afraid inside gets up in front of something that's scaring the hell out of them is that they, I anyway, over respond and make an idiot of myself. Media. Um, Media Simpson. Anyone? Do you all remember Media Simpson? She worked at the library. Oh, she worked here? Well, there you go. <laughs> anyway, um, she was the interpreter, as you've been told. And she was this astounding little sparrow of a woman with um, jam jar glasses. Uh, she looked like a female version of Emperor Hirohito, <laughs> in my view. And she was. Uh, hard as nails, beautiful speaker of te reo and a great philosopher. And anyway, I stood up and I wanted to say something sort of that would grab attention. So I said, tēnā koutou e te traipunara, kei roto yo koutou ringa, o kūraho e pupuri ana. <laughs> Thinking that would be a cool way to say, <laughs> that the, the, the sort of the life of my family, my children and my grandchildren, was in their hands. <laughs> well, I'll translate. I'll, I, this time I'll own it. So I said, I said you know, uh, good afternoon, members of the tribunal. You have my testicles in your hands. <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's a cool Māori way of saying it. That's tūturu. Um, and, poor, and media went, bing! <laughs> and, you know, she had jam jar glasses, so these... <laughs> it, was like, it was like looking at, what, you know, one of those, um, you know, one of those little yellow things with overalls on and a big... <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. Minion, minion yeah, it was like, like, it's like, like a minion. And she looked at me and she was furious. <laughs> and Graham said, hey, translate it, because he was having fun. Translate it. <laughs> and she said, and she really did sound like the Queen. She said, members of the tribunal, you are grappling with my manhood. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, she, she was a gem. Anyway, <laughs> after I gave my evidence, I went outside and she came running out and her shoe was outside. It was a stiletto. And she was only about that tall and she picked up her red stiletto and she went whack on my head. And I still have the scar. And from that day on until she passed away, every time I saw her, she would reach for her shoe. So that's my story of the, of the Te Reo claim. Um, I just want to, uh, I mean, those were hopeful times. But in many ways, our imaginations were more narrow than we've discovered they could have been. Um, we talked about Te Reo as a rite of Māori. We talked about the saving of a language that belonged to a minority of indigenous people that needed to be saved. And it certainly did. And in the 20 or 30 years that followed, uh, as we said in the Y262 claim, government policy in response to that need, um, while perhaps well-intentioned, didn't help at all. Uh, as we found in Y262, once Kohanga and Kura Kaupapa took off, the Māori demand for real Māori education was bottomless. Was bottomless. There's no doubt about this. The trajectory was sharp and high. And the government didn't understand that or didn't want to because of the cost of training enough teachers and early childhood educators to meet that demand. So that by the time of the early to mid 1990s, the demand hit a roof, hit a sharp ceiling and plummeted as quality suffered for lack of resourcing. And that needed to be fixed. So and we've had uh, some time during which to digest that most important of issues, but there are many others. I'm not sure where we've got to. It's kind of out of my bailiwick now. Nonetheless, it seemed to us that in respect of Te Reo, the gap between 1986 and 2008 when Y262 came out showed precisely the causal relationship between the decline of a language and the failure of policy and or the failure of will. Because it could not be said Māoris did not wish to speak Māori. It could not be said Māoris did not wish their children to grow up speaking Māori. Almost all of them did. And the system failed to provide for that, we said very firmly in Y262. So, 10, 12 years on, where have we got to? Well, in some ways, we've got to some good places. One thing that I think is quite impressive is that Te that Te Reo Māori is now seen as a New Zealand thing. We're not fighting for the survival of Te Reo just for Māori anymore. We're fighting for the survival of Te Reo for New Zealanders. That's shown by the fact that you have to queue to get into a Māori class because all the Pākehas have beaten you. <laughs> now that might be a little annoying for some, but in my view, that's an extraordinary outcome because in 1986, there was no way that was even imaginable. I want to give you one anecdote about uh, the courts to show the shift in attitude. It used to be that when um, a courtroom opened, uh, the crier would say, um, silence, all stand, for his or her honour, the Queen's judge. If it was one judge or their honours, the Queen's judges, if it was more than one judge. 2012, Māori Language Week, that changed as the district court and then later courts decided that the introductions and the 
the, the intros and outros of a court would be bilingual. So we got Kia Rite Mo Te Kai Whakawa with the Queen here. Two kua, silence all stand for their honours, the Queen's judges. Good. And at the end of the day, Kua wā te Te Kai Whakawa, e tu kua. His honour will now retire. Please stand. Um, and then Crown Law decided they should get on the waka. So when they stood up, they said, Te nā koe e te kai whakawā, ko Smith taku ingoa e tuana o te krauna. Greetings, Your Honour. My name is Smith and I appear for uh, the Crown. They did it bilingually. Everywhere. Um, and the defence bar, in the context of criminal work, got its nose out of joint because the Crown was the one that was sending those Māoris to jail. How come they were doing it? And they thought this was, you know, this, this, was, this was a bit of a, um, a bit of a have. Anyway, they learnt too. Then the judges felt a little out of place because there's all this Māori going on and they said, well, good morning, Council. And they felt whakamā about that. I'm telling you, I was there. They felt whakamā about it. So in the mainstream courts, judges would say, what can, they'd ring me up and say, what can we say? So we ran a little training session for judges to be able to respond. Anyway, 2017, something like that, I walk into the Court of Appeal where I was at that stage. The junior judge of three, uh, counsel stand up, two appellants, the Crown's there, three judges. For the first five minutes, everyone is speaking in Māori. And I'm the only one in the room who speaks Māori. <laughs> in fact, I'm the only Māori in the room, and I haven't said a word. Now, no one ruled that. No law got enacted. It just happened. Now, the famous case of Mihaka and the police the famous case of Mihaka and the police, which said uh, in 1977, isn't it? 77, that uh, the language of the courts in New Zealand is English, and it has been since 1392. <laughs> which would be interesting to tell Kupe. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Based on a, a statute of Edward III's. Not that he'd heard of New Zealand. Um, uh, that, uh, that case um, was what it was, but if you come forward to 2017 and that day in court that sort of made, made my eyes pop up a little bit like media's, um, I realised something quite important about the power of the rail. Because when the rail canoe gets paddled in the door, it brings this cargo of mana Māori, wairua Māori, Modi Māori, with it. It's not just words. There's, there's this powerful cargo of a world view, te ahurea Māori, comes with it. Even when you've got a bunch of Pākehās haltingly saying, te nā koutou inga kei whakawā, ko mea taku ingo e tuana o te krone, and the poor old judge saying, Marina, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever they might be saying. And my theory is this, <coughs> no judge in that courtroom could have written mihaka. When the reo walks in the room, te ao Māori walks in the room. And that changes the law. I know it's subtle, I know it's not revolutionary, but once you get a different flavour in the water, stuff changes. And I think... Uh, we are in that process of hobbling towards a different goal in an ad hoc way, completely unplanned, as usual. Um, no one like PDP in a position to be able to run it, yet we are walking there organically. When someone started singing the national anthem in Māori and English, something I never did when I was a kid, no government official said it's time to do that. It just happened. Still happens, and it's done in Māori first. 
there is still no proclamation, no law, that says that must be so. And the Waitangi Tribunal report in 1986, the Te Reo Claim report, was focused on the Reo for Māori. When in fact what we've discovered is the value of the Reo for all. And that power is what will save it. Because it's no longer other. It's us. And once we get there, it seems to me, we are not far away from real districts. It seems to me the next logical step. There should be districts around the country which are at least bilingual, probably monolingual. And I'll tell you what, great tourism if we ever get to open the borders. I'll bet you the Gisborne District Council and the Eastern Bay of Plenty District Council would see huge advantage in a requirement that all signage must be bilingual and all, you know, state, you know, all public stuff must be bilingual. And the government will get on board, right? And all of a sudden, we'll have openly and legally, fully, Māori-speaking public sector and actually private sector um, agencies and operations. I don't think that's, a, I mean, unthinkable in 1986, but now actually not that unthinkable. Probably quite sensible and about time. Kia ora tato. I mihi ana ki a koe, ja Justice Williams i uu mā tauranga i whāngai hia kia mātou i te rānei. I mihi ana, i mihi ana, i mihi ana. We will now move into the final part of our event, a facilitated discussion with Justice Williams, PDP Walker and Dr Vincent olsen Reader. Dr Vincent olsen Reader, no ngā pōtiki a tama pahore Ngāti Pūkenga Ngai Te Rangi me Te Arawa, was the first student to write and defend a PhD in Te Reo Māori at Victoria University in Wellington. His thesis examined the effectiveness of bilingualism as a theoretical approach to revitalisation. He now teaches at the university, publishes research, fiction and poetry, and helps run national language planning workshops through Kura Whakaraora. I will now hand the rako to Dr Olsen Reader to begin our facilitated discussion. Then nā koutou. A katira ngā mihi nui ki a tātou, a kua pai nei uh, ki, ki roto i tō tātou whare i te rangi nei, te manu tūtaonga, te nā koutou, o tira uh, ki a kōrua, uh, ngā manu hiri tūā rangi i hara mai ki te whāngai mai i wā kōrua kōrero, uh, ngā mahara uh, o te wā, uh, o te kreme, um, o tira te whāngai mai i ngā taonga kōrero, um, e tika ana ki a rangona e, e, e tātou, te nā rā kōrua. All right, so I'd like to start um, with, uh, I, I guess, uh, it sounds like a simple question, but I would really love to know um, both of your thoughts about this. Is this the climate that we're here at the moment in Aotearoa? We're having this conversation for a start. We've got the law, which is in its second iteration now. Um, we've got kōhanga reo, kura kaupapa, tertiary study, te mātāwai, all of these things in effect. Is this what Ngā Kai Whakapumo and Te Reo Māori Society imagined um, back in the back in those times? That's my first question. I don't know if any. Kia ora, Vincent. Kia ora, anō koe. Ko he pai o koro a tahua ki a tātou. Uh, tēnā rā koe, Vincent. Hei te mihi kā koe i tō rahi muri i a koe. I te aki tō pātou. At the end of the tribunal and the final week, there were four weeks of hearings, um, Ngā Kai Whakapuma put together what they wanted, a document with 70 concrete changes <laughs> requested of the New Zealand government, a full national television channel, a fully funded Māori broadcasting system to be funded on an equal basis of European radio stations. The average European radio station at the time in the big cities was running on a budget of two to four million dollars, the ZBs. Anyway, we, we got some of it, we got Iwi Radio but they got $200,000 a year. <laughs> and they've only had that figure since 1991. It's been bumped up for inflation to 300000 
ne never changed. So they're running on about one-tenth of what any equivalent local radio station would be requiring. Uh, the Kura have uh, made their own way and established themselves in education, but I'd leave Kura Kopa for Māori to talk about that. They talk about having a lot of battles about getting a, a, a fully Māori education system established. On official recognition, Ngākei Whakapumo are disappointed, as I said in my statement, that we did not get a declaration that Māori could not only speak Māori but also write Māori, because this creates an industry like the Welsh Language Act, where all government departments are formally bilingual, and they have to report every year about the extent of written and spoken Māori use in the departments. Any hui in any government department can call any hui in Welsh. Any time, any day of the week. But that's, I guess that's what the story is when you've got control of your own country. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I don't think Ngā Kaifakapumo uh, would be happy with where we've got to. On the other hand, they wouldn't be depressed at least not clinically so. Um, yeah. I think, you know, it's time for another orchestrated push. I th you know, the soil is ready now. Uh, what we appear to be lacking is um, a bold and courageous strategy for the next step forward and this time, not just for Te Ao Māori, but Te Ao Te Aroa. Um, my theory is we, 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 you, won't have any enemies on this. So if I had a worry at all, is it, it is that the structures that are established to provide for the growth and sustenance of the reo are not producing the groundswell that is, sorry, are not harnessing the groundswell that is plainly out there. And so it is being squandered. Yeah. We don't have to win hearts anymore. We just have to be courageous in what we want to do with the hearts. And I don't, th and imaginative, and I don't think we're being either, to be frank. Do you, do you think um, that sort of um, kia ora, tō tahi mihi ani kia kōrua, wā kōrua whakautu. Do you think that the the need for a groundswell is um, partly due to the institutional support that we now have for the reo because we have so many entities um, in government or who are working um, within government for the reo or is it a need from uh, so is the is the need with institutions to create or harness that groundswell, or is the need with the communities needing to go out and produce that voice and really voice that opinion to the entities that are around? Um, there's no substitute for the local level, as I said at the beginning. Our iwi in the centres of 1978 had one child under the age of 30 able to speak Māori. In fact, in Richard Benton's survey, he said four. The Kaumato said it was one, Māori or Kingi. After the Whakatipurangarua Mano experiment with that community, mobilising around the language and making it a top priority, in Ōtaki Township now, I think the Māori population, the Māori population there is 2,000, and I think the, uh, the majority, therefore, of adults in Ōtaki are now Māori-speaking of all adults. It's a Māori-speaking town of the kind Joe's talked about, of that kind, from one, from one. But that's if you make the language a top priority and your whole family has to live in, you know, in obedience to this sort of push, kōrō Māori for kākui te reo Māori. And um, uh, that's a really hard demand, but it has succeeded there at that local level. Um, I'd just like to go back a bit to the history. Um, what is history? Sometimes history isn't the history we're hearing. The history about the language, television and broadcasting cases, this is only one of the claims. There were six of them, of this size, which were begun in 83, and they proceeded until 1999. Some were bigger than this. The broadcasting assets case, which went through all of the courts in Molesworth Street, and then to the Privy Council in London with the Huirangi and Sir Graham Lanama. 
The frequencies cases, which took three years through the tribunal, got to the Court of Appeal, stunned the Crown with a win. There were six of these cases on broadcasting television in the language, which ran over 16 continuous years from this point. So my worry about the history is that um, your question on institutions and we've got progress and everything else, we've got to be honest about the history. The Crown now is writing the history. But the Crown needs to accept that it absolutely stonewalled on all fronts. And still doing so. Māori Television shifted its building a couple of years ago from a building where it had a studio and then Cabinet blocked it getting a new studio. Mm. No more apprenticeships for Māori Television. Oh, your young people are doing lots on the internet, they don't need apprenticeships. Only a $6 million build. Easily dismissed with a wave of the hand across the road. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, Joe, and I'm not clinically depressed. <laughs> but, you know, Huirangi was on this thing too, you know. We've got to be realistic. Kia ora tata. Kia ora tēnā. Um, well, my point is not that the institutions are any good at all. Um, it, the, the vibe is there in a way that it never was in 86 or, or really through the 20th century and probably not even for the first decade of the 21st century. But the vibe is there now as... Um, we get old, and those who are replacing us are much more bicultural and more likely to be bilingual than us. <coughs> Certainly much more used to the idea of iwi taking leadership roles in communities in hard times, and more generally being positive contributors to the communities and not being the threat that it was thought they would be during the initial claims era of the early 90s. Um, so, and, and New Zealand has, I think, come to the clear understanding that kaupapa Māori and reo Māori is fundamental to New Zealandness in a way that my parents' generation never got to because their parents always thought home was halfway around the globe. So that's an energy and a resource that we either capture or squander. What I'm worried about is that we are not capturing it. Mm -hmm. And that's institutional, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the role of Totafiri and Te Mātāwe, uh, as well as you know, broadcasting at a time when broadcasting as a platform is you know, potentially the steam engine. Who knows? That's more Pitipi's gig than mine. Um, we have to come up with new, new ideas, new platforms, and so on. My point is simply that the hearts are now open in a way that they have never been open since 1840. And just like Te Reo Māori and after them Ngā Kaifakapumo, this is another opportunity, this is another point in history, and we either waste it or we grab it. If we waste it, then Pitipi's pessimism is justified and the language will die except as a ceremonial language. If we take advantage of it and squeeze the juice out of it, then my reo will still be spoken by my grandchildren and their grandchildren. And Ōtaki will be a Māori-speaking town, so will uh, Rotorua, Gisborne, Hastings, Kaikohe, Whangarei, so on. Mm -hmm. Once those heartlands are captured, we can build out from those beachheads. But we've got to be able to see that as a possibility. We've got to be able to think about that. And I'm not hearing anything that the leaders in respect of our reo and the next generation of battles that need to be fought are th even thinking like this. And as we said in the Y262 claim, the Māori language plan um, prepared by uh, the government wasn't either. So, I mean, if we're serious about this, we need... 800,000 speakers of Māori by such and such a year and this is how we're going to do it if we're serious about it. Now, those of us with hearts open, and that seems to me to be a team of five million, need to make the institutions produce these plans mm -hmm. so we don't get the disaster that we got in the 90s 
when Kua Hanga Reo enrollment went, poof, we can't do that again. You, you get to blow this once, and then you blow it f- for all time. Ka pai tēnā, tēnā koe, Joe, massive wero for us, um, all of us who work in, in institutions um, to pick that up, so tēnā koe. Um, one final question, because I've been asked to wrap up, is, um, Joe, you brought up the idea of districts of language, bilingual signage and all of those kinds of things, and um, one of the things that I was wondering is, part of this conversation, um, since Te Mātāwai was implemented, since Te Pai Pai Motuhake did their report, um, we, there has been talk of a Māori language minister, and so my final question to both of you is Māori language minister, Minister, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Tēnā koe. Ai nā hoki. You know what? Who cares? That's, we constantly look to... If, if we get the tick over the road, it's all going to be fine? No. Not at all. This change is not going to happen because it happened in the beehive. This change is going to happen on the ground, making the beehive respond. The ground counts. Everyone's got to be a minister of the deal, or we lose it. Kapai, te nā koe. Um, nō reira e, e karema koa tai te wā, uh, kia whakakapi i tō tatou hui. Just before I hand it back over for our final um, uh, our final wrap-up, I'd just like to acknowledge you both. Um, e jo, e, e, kāre e tika, kia mihi te teine ki te tuakana, engari i runga i te kaupapa. <laughs> Koi nei, e, e mihi ana ki a koe a, 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 e te tuakana a mo tō whakapau kaha a i rutu i ngā tau kia ora i tō tātou reo. O tira ki a koe a, e, e matua piriwi a ngā tirau kawa tenei e mihi ana. Next time you see me, I promise I will wear a suit. Tēnā kōrua. <laughs>